fourth patient in history cured of HIV. A 66-year-old man with no signs of the virus for 17 months. Doctors at City of Hope Hospital in California have reported the case of a 66-year-old man who appears to have been cured of HIV. This is the fourth such incident in history and the second this year. The patient had leukemia and received stem cells from a donor with a rare genetic mutation to treat cancer. After the transplant, doctors noticed a lasting remission of the virus. Worldwide, approximately 37 million people are infected with HIV. Only about 60% of this group is taking antiretroviral drugs. About 1 million people die from the infection every year. Despite long research, there is still no cure for the virus, but antiretroviral drugs suppress it to a level that becomes undetectable. This allows HIV-infected people to live a relatively normal life. So far, only three cases have been known in which long-term remission of the disease was observed. People referred to as the Berlin patient, the London patient, and the last case earlier this year of the New York patient were treated for leukemia. Patients in Berlin and London were transplanted with bone marrow stem cells from people who carried a rare mutation in the CCR5 gene, often used by the virus to infect cells. People with this mutation appear to be immune to infection with the virus. In the case of an American, a stem cell transplant was performed for the treatment of acute myeloid leukemia AML. The stem cells came from umbilical cord blood from a donor carrying the aforementioned mutation in the CCR5 gene. Now, California doctors have reported another, fourth case of being cured of HIV. Detailed results are to be presented at the AIDS 2022 conference in Montreal. The 66-year-old patient, who wishes to remain anonymous, has been HIV positive for 31 years. The man, who is nicknamed the Hope City patient, after the hospital where he was treated, was diagnosed with HIV in 1988. Only a year earlier, in March 1987, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration FDA, had approved the first antiretroviral therapy, the HIV drug, azidothymidine, AZT. It was not until the mid-1990s that HIV combination therapies, i.e. therapies that combine several HIV drugs, were introduced to increase the effectiveness of treatment and prevent the development of drug resistance in patients. Such combination therapies are now the standard of care for HIV. The Hope City patient took antiretroviral drugs for over 31 years to control his HIV. At one point, the man developed AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome, meaning his white blood cell count dropped to critically low levels. He took AZT and some other early HIV drugs that were prescribed individually before switching to highly effective combination antiretroviral therapy in the 1990s. Decades later, in 2018, the patient developed acute myeloid leukemia. As part of the treatment for both cancer and HIV, Doctors transplanted blood stem cells from a donor who carried a mutation in the CCR5 gene. After the transplant, mutated, HIV-resistant cells gradually took over his immune system. In March 2021, under the watchful eye of the medical team, the patient stopped taking antiretroviral drugs and to date there are no signs of HIV replication in his body. The team describes the patient as being in long-term remission as there has been no trace of active virus in his body for 17 months. We were thrilled to let him know that his HIV was in remission and he no longer needed to take the antiretroviral therapy he had been on for over 30 years, said Dr. 
John Addicta of the City of Hope Clinic. He saw many of his friends die of AIDS in the early days of the disease and faced great stigma when he was diagnosed with HIV in 1988. But now he can celebrate. We cannot find evidence of HIV replication in his body, she added. The case of the Hope City patient is very similar to the case of the Berlin patient and the London patient. Both HIV-infected men were being treated for cancer, but the treatments of these patients were somewhat different from each other. The Berlin patient underwent radiation therapy, two rounds of bone marrow stem cell transplants from a donor who carried the CCR5 gene, and chemotherapy. The transplant was intended to prevent the virus from replicating in the patient's body by replacing the patient's immune cells with those of the donor. While the body's radiation and chemotherapy were directed against the HIV virus remaining in the body and the cancer cells. The London patient has had one stem cell transplant, reduced intensity chemotherapy and no whole body radiation therapy. Testing 30 months after stopping antiretroviral drugs did not detect active viral infection in the patient's blood samples or in the cerebrospinal fluid, semen, intestinal tissue, and lymphoid tissue. In addition, 99% of the patient's immune cells were derived from the donor's stem cells, indicating that the stem cell transplant was successful. In the case of the New York patient, the therapy was different. The woman also suffered from cancer, acute myeloid leukemia. She received a stem cell transplant from umbilical cord blood cells. Why blood and not bone marrow? All because of the woman's ethnicity. Doctors have been unable to find a matching bone marrow donor. The majority of donor registries are Caucasian making it much more difficult to find a donor for patients of other ethnic backgrounds. Using an alternative method had several other advantages as well. A bone marrow transplant is a difficult operation and is associated with frequent complications. In the case of two previous patients in long-term HIV remission, the bone marrow transplant resulted in serious side effects. Their bodies reacted badly. One patient nearly died, the other lost 30 kilograms of weight and suffered partial hearing loss within a year. The researchers admitted that cord blood is more easily accepted by the body than a bone marrow transplant, which means that complications and rejection of the transplant are less likely. In theory, this makes the risky treatment needed to get HIV into remission a bit easier, which could make a big difference. About three months after the transplant, all of the patient's leukocytes did not come from her old marrow, but from cord blood stem cells. This means they all contained a protective version of the CCR5 gene, blocking HIV for good. Scientists have discovered microbes living deep beneath the seabed at 120 degrees Celsius. In sediments excavated off the coast of Japan from a depth of about 1.2 kilometers below the seabed. Where the temperature reaches 120 degrees Celsius, scientists have found microbes thriving. This discovery shows that life can survive higher temperatures and is present at greater depths than previously thought. Since the discovery of the biosphere deep below the seabed in the mid-1990s, scientists have studied the conditions under which organisms thrive in this isolated and generally food-free environment. They wondered what conditions determine the limits of the existence of life. In 2016, an international group of scientists set out to sea aboard the Japanese ship Chikyu to characterize the biosphere in more detail. During the expedition, samples were taken from a borehole drilled about 125 kilometers off the coast of Japan in the Nankai Trench. 
at a depth of about 1.2 kilometers below the seabed. The researchers encountered a small but very active community of microbes. Temperature increases rapidly with depth and pressure. According to the researchers, the temperature at the very end of the sediment core they collected was 120 degrees Celsius, and yet the microbes found thrived in such conditions. The new findings shed light on the survival strategies of organisms living in this harsh environment. The research results were published in the journal Nature Communications. Life seems to be everywhere. I would speculate that wherever there is energy that microorganisms can use, life will find a way, says Tina Troider of the University of California, Los Angeles. It is possible that life exists at even higher temperatures. The only way to find out is to drill even deeper, he adds. However, in laboratory experiments so far, no microbes have been found that would develop above 122 degrees Celsius. The seabed in the area where the scientists drilled is about 4 kilometers below the water surface. And the samples contained sediments that were up to 50 million years old. The researchers counted the number of microbes in these sediments and measured their metabolic rates using highly sensitive measurements of methane production and sulfate reduction. They found that the metabolic rate of these microbes was unusually high for such a deep biosphere, especially since in the shallower sediments, where it is much cooler and more abundant with life. The metabolism of the microbes living there is much slower. The temperature of 120 degrees C does a lot of damage to cells. So microbes need intensive metabolism to produce enough energy to repair this damage. It's a race for survival, says Troida. The energy required to repair thermal damage increases dramatically with temperature. And most of that energy is probably required to counteract the constant amino acid changes and protein loss of function, says Troida. Detecting microbial metabolic activity in sediments with less than 500 cells per cc, which is seven orders of magnitude less than the average surface sediment, is not at all easy. We worked in extremely controlled, sterile conditions and performed a large number of control experiments simultaneously with sample incubations, says Florian Schubert of the German Research Center for Geosciences who conducted the analyzers as part of his PhD. We even incubated the gamma sterilized sludge as well as drilling fluid from the drill hole to detect any potential non-biological reactions or microbial activity caused by the contamination, adds Jens Kalmeyer. The hypercell activity of sulfate reductants and methanogens in the deepest and warmest sediments is apparently driven by hydrogen and acetate from the sediments. Acetate, which is a small organic molecule also found in vinegar, is of particular interest as a potential food source, says Verena Hoyer of Marum in Germany. Acetate reaches concentrations of over 10 mmol per liter in rock pore water, which is exceptionally high for marine sediments, he adds. For Bo Barker Jorgensen of Aarhus University, who is one of the pioneers of deep biosphere research, these findings are fascinating. First of all, because the research into the deep biosphere so far shows that the microbes inhabiting it generally slow down their metabolism, and here it is the opposite. What we've discovered so far is that the microbes in the deep biosphere are an extremely lethargic community slowly gnawing away at the last remains of buried organic matter from a million years ago. But the deep biosphere is full of surprises. Finding life evolving with such a high metabolic rate at such high temperatures beneath the seafloor sparks our imagination of how life could evolve or survive in similar environments beyond Earth. Emphasizes Jorgensen. It's unclear what these thermophilic microbes are because the team was unable to sequence their DNA. 
It is also not clear how they ended up in the sediments. Before the sediments reached the current depth, it was a much cooler environment. Scientists believe that several microbes may have been present during their deposition. And they may have somehow survived until the temperature began to rise as the sediments descended lower and lower.